520. Okay, 520. Uh, Glendora, this is episode two. Um, all right, Glendora, I think where I left it off was uh, my roommate, a female roommate that I had met, was had this apartment with me, and she was studying dance and worked part-time as an executive secretary. Now, she invited me uh, to meet her, her employer, and they were going to have lunch at Club 21, and she wanted me to meet him. He heard about me uh, since she had spoken about me, and it happened to be that his birthday was on the same day as mine, so it was a birthday luncheon. Now, he loved music and art, and Joan, the name of my roommate, uh, assisted him in collecting American art. So he met many young artists and he was also on the board of directors of the Guggenheim Museum. Now his name was Edmund. He heard me play later and wanted to meet my teacher, Dr. Saperton, and consequently enjoyed many social events with the Gershwin family and also Duke Ellington we met and uh, many pianists with reputable names that had studied with Dr. Sapton at Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Now, Dr. Sapton heard of a summer course at the French Academy of Music near Monte Carlo, which was headed by the famous woman pianist at that time by the name of Jean-Marie Deray, who had made a hit in New York City. He suggested I apply, which I did, and it was decided I attend for the summer. I got a diploma from the academy and met many people besides Jean-Marie Deray. Uh, there was a Bulgarian violinist conductor who became interested in me as a person and musician. I wrote Edmund and Dr. Sapton about my experience uh, since it was about time for me to come back home to New York and they immediately phoned me on the night rate and said uh, please hurry and get back home soon. Um, I was quite surprised when Edmund wrote how much he valued me and would be interested in possibly marrying me. I was surprised since Edmund's marriage had problems however he was not interested in divorce or remarriage. On the other hand, my music was so important to me that I really did not plan on marriage. I was quite confused. Dr. Sapton added to the mix by saying, why would Edmund want a poor musician like you? Just be glad that you are safely back home. Edmund was 23 years older than I was and his children were all grown in their early 20s or near 20. Dr. Sapton suggested <clears throat> I meet an older woman uh, who had in her uh, younger years, she had studied with him, uh, her name was Jean Thorpe, very nice person, who had been married to a rather wealthy man who had helped her and supported her music. Sapton suggested she meet with me to discuss my music and future. She also stressed how fortunate I was to have a person like Edmund interested in me and my music. Now, going back to Barbara, who was my former employer in Grand Rapids, who encouraged me to study in New York, she would often, she was in New York, and uh, actually she had married Carl Andre, the talented artist, and she often telephoned me to see how I was doing and we'd meet for um, lunch or, or dinner. And um, uh, she was really against my possible marriage to Edmund. She had visions that I should marry a prince. That was all great and fine, but Edmund really was a prince in my mind. So Sapton stepped in and insisted I telephone Barbara in his presence and explained to her that presently I could not see her because he felt no one should discourage me against Edmund. Edmund and I knew each other for three years before we did marry in 1969. It was the best decision to marry 
Edmund, who loved music and supported my idea of performing. Also, it sure put my parents' mind at ease, and my sponsors met Edmund and thought this was a Cinderella story. Now, Edmund and I would drive around on weekends looking at homes for sale. Finally, we settled for a beautiful home in Westchester, overlooking the Hudson River. It was owned by Elizabeth Gordon Norcross. She was the editor of House Beautiful magazine. She was a friend of Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, so of course many of his ideas were in the house. Uh, each room had, uh, the walls were of different woods, like one room would be with birch, another one with cherry, another with, with mahogany. It, it was very interesting and very beautiful. Uh, we spent a year having it restored um, and met an expert at that from Panama who restored the woods. And uh, we also had a greenhouse, a Lord and Burnham greenhouse that we restored. As my husband said, it's a jewel box for two people. It was not large, but on 1.8 acres, as I say, overlooking the Hudson River. Uh, a gentleman from Panama suggested he could introduce me to Lee Strasberg when he found out I was a pianist. Uh, and Lee Strasberg, as you know, is the film director and teacher uh, but of films. So he wanted me to meet him to discuss my music and performances. I did, and Lee Strasberg suggested he gather people at his apartment for them to meet me and hear me perform. Everything going on, I did not feel ready at that time. So I didn't, I didn't uh, go ahead with that at that time. We were busy uh, looking, uh, you know, at different homes, and uh, I mean, we were working on different things and trying to get adjusted to our new environment. Um, both working, of course, toward the American dream. So, one year after our marriage, the stock market crash came in 1970. And it really hit Edmund hard. So being in trouble financially, he said, I think you better divorce me because I'm out of money. I said, well, I think I might take my chance because I think you have the talent and ability to make it many times over. And I didn't believe in divorcing for that reason anyway. He still put the house up for sale. A young doctor who was single and in cancer research, and also he was a surgeon, he fell in love with the house. He said it was so romantic overlooking the Hudson River on the 1.8 acres. And it was great for entertaining. Um, house Beautiful actually photographed a lot there, so they entertained there. And it was on three levels, a lower level, a middle level where the house was with a courtyard, and an upper level. He said he could put a pool in the lower level, which would be great for entertaining. So he offered three times what my husband paid. My husband telephoned his younger brother, who was in admiration of my husband, and asked his advice. He said, I take the money and run. However, my husband gave it great thought and took my advice and made it many times over in the end. Working hard, he became chairman of Governor Nelson Rockefeller's Business Advisory Committee. He had Rockefeller's designer from Japan, as I recall, to discuss what kind of pool to put on the property. He suggested a black pool to reflect trees, etc. So my husband had a 20 by 40 foot black pool, heated, put in. He knew I loved swimming and you know, I loved fountains and uh, like the Europeans and Italians had, so he actually put a fountain in on the deck also overlooking the Hudson. Uh, my husband worked hard with his consulting, uh, management consulting company. Uh, in fact, he wrote a book on the marginal cost system, which was something he had 
learned from a mentor of his, and he was he developed it. Uh, he was in the top 50 of management consulting companies. Plus, he worked on increasing his purchase of real estate, commercial and residential. He did have trouble with real estate managers finding a good one, so he asked me what I thought of him training his oldest son, Eddie Jr., to manage the, the buildings since Eddie Jr. had trouble locating the right job. I didn't know what to say because he was not my son. So I said, well, he's not my son, you know. Uh, it'd be better, uh, you know him better than I do. So he, uh, he did give him the job in the end. I should have said no because it turned out to be a thorn in my husband and my side. It was just very difficult. We found out that you could not trust him. As we were working and progressing along, my husband worked on arranging auditions for performing and managers along with his business proposals. He also purchased a nine-foot Steinway concert grand, which he bought for me on time. And uh, eventually, some a year or so later, I believe it was, I they made me a Steinway artist. Um, we traveled through snowstorms knee-deep for his business interviews and my auditions. Some were failures and some were successful. My husband had a saying, a saying, they think we are drowning and we keep popping up. Now, uh, Edmund was gifted with fight and determination just as I was. And we also used our home for a lot of entertaining which it was designed for, so it was a great place for, you know, uh, business entertaining and so forth. My husband asked me if, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, my church asked me if they could use it for a benefit. Uh, consequently, it was the start of a lot of prominent people uh, that came to our home, and one was Cab Calloway, who entertained at this particular benefit. We had members of the Rockefeller family and the Annenberg family, and um, then later on, we at Skitch Henderson, uh, we met him, and he came there, Christopher Forbes and Robert Forbes, because of an art collection we collected, and uh, then it included the director of the Metropolitan Museum, who wanted to view the art collection. And then we even, even Cary Grant called us wanting to rent the house in exchange for one of his homes since his daughter was going to attend master school, um, which we had to decline. Of course, Frank Lloyd Wright had stayed at the home also when Mrs. Norcross, uh, the original owner, lived there. My husband and I, uh, Glendora, we had a very good relationship. His business opened doors for me, and my music and performing opened doors for him. Uh, he entertained many business, uh, many uh, executives and their wives, which usually involved me having to entertain on the piano, and then opening with prayer before the meal. Uh, let's say again, you know, Glendora, we were working toward the American dream, right? As we're taught in this country. Uh, he often reassured me that I was a big help for his business. We never, never gave up. Got disappointed, but one gets back up and, you know, you learn from any failure. My husband also said, you have no idea what that world is like out there. And I really didn't. He protected me. Now I have found out, haven't I, about the silent thieves, as I call them. But he is not around to help me, and they know it. On my own, and also through managers, uh, it resulted in a lot of concerts. Uh, my husband worked on uh, auditions for me and, and uh, 
wrote many orchestras and so forth, along with his uh, meetings of interviews. Uh, so it included uh, also managers. We had a couple of them, um, but it resulted in concerts in London, Rome, Mexico City. It was international. And then actually in Mexico, Mexico City, it resulted in sending a video up in satellite in the United States here, of which 130 PBS TV stations took it and really had shown it in many large cities in the United States. Uh, so we met Skitch Henderson. Um, he had a demonstration tape made with me in London, with the London Philharmonic, and had me as soloist for the opening of the Sheboygan Opera House in Michigan, uh, plus an appearance in Carnegie Hall. and. In my performances in the United States, uh, one conductor wanted me to play in Rome different times, which was, uh, you know, very interesting. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, I also performed many times in the Whale Concert Hall, I mean the concert hall next to Carnegie Hall. And many others. We had a TV interview with Victor Borga and the uh, pianist Eugene List, which was fun. Uh, Victor Borga is uh, quite a personality, and we had a good time. However, it, you know, it all required a lot of work and time and preparation. Uh, very seldom did we go on a vacation. It usually had to be involved with business. My husband would often work on holidays. Now, my husband also had claustrophobia and did not like to fly, so in those days he insisted on taking the Concorde, which was a wonderful experience, and he was even still nervous on that plane, but um, we got through it much, it was much shorter, of course, and quicker than the regular planes. So, now my husband, uh, he also knew of a resort which was originated by the Rockefeller family near South Palm Beach where we would stay occasionally. It was not ostentatious. It had cottage-like rooms attached on the ocean uh, with a club-like room for entertainment and meals. And uh, later we managed to stay at the Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach. As I say, my husband never stayed long, as I said, he did not like vacations. So, on one trip, my husband heard of a showing of 19th century British art at the Playhouse in Palm Beach, Florida. So we went to view the paintings, and after we, when we were viewing them, we met the dealer from London, who, uh, who, um, you know, we were very impressed with the paintings. Uh, he, he showed us many paintings, and we were very impressed with them. My husband wanted me to pick out two of them to purchase, which I did to start a collection. My husband had a collection of American paintings, which I thought could be improved on, so he ended up donating it to the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York. Uh, the only painting he didn't get rid of was a sergeant painting, which has another story of how badly it was handled for sale because later with the estate it was up for sale and ended up, I believe, all the money. It, it, they dragged it out so long because of any problems in selling it and it ended up, uh, you know, it was just legal fees, so we got no profit out of it. So, and... Um, Anyway, he, he donated these other paintings to the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York, and he proceeded to study and collect all the 19th, you know, many 19th century British art. Edmund sat up many nights into the morning doing research on the 19th century British art and keeping in touch with the London dealer. We made a trip to London where the dealer introduced us to the Forbes collection, which was housed in London. 
It was a fabulous collection, which, which resulted us in meeting Christopher Forbes, uh, who was in charge of their collection. Uh, my husband explained ideas with Christopher, uh, nicknamed Kip Forbes, about the paintings that were up for sale. We became friends and attended many Victorian tea parties that Kip was in charge of. In a rather short period of time, we acquired a beautiful collection of 45 paintings. Now, Kip's brother, Robert, he took photos of the collection, came to our home and took photos of the collection. And Kip stated that our collection was the best in the United States at that time of 19th century British art. Forbes' collection was much larger, and that was housed in London. So that was in London, and ours was in the United States. But my husband named the collection, actually he labeled it as the Suzanne and Edmund art collection because of my assistance. And also the collection was exhibited in the United States and traveled to Europe. They were like our children going on a trip. Uh, Skitch Henderson also gave us two Eng uh, King Charles, uh, Charles Spaniels by name. We named them Tippy and Lady Dash. We named the female Lady Dash uh, since it was the name of Queen Victoria's favorite dog. Before that, we had our beautiful Irish setter, Coco, which was Coco like Coco Chanel, and we showed her, and she got a lot of ribbons when we, a beautiful dog. Anyway, we were enjoying the fruits of our labor. So on one of the trips, my husband also decided to look for some property in Florida as either an investment or a place for us to go to. We looked at many homes, including commercial properties for investment. We did end up getting a small home, a condo, in Manalapan, Florida, since the large homes were much too large and needed restoration and were too expensive. My husband had a Frank Lloyd Wright room added with a fountain and a skylight since he knew I loved fountains. He purchased this, uh, the Steinway Grand that my sponsors had in my apartment for this particular condo. We did not go to the home often because, as I said, he did not like vacations. Now, at one of our invitations in New York to dinner, we went to the University Club in New York, uh, invited to a dinner gathering there. We met a partner of White and Case Law Firm, which had his eyes on my husband. Of course, through business connections, my husband met many people, but I felt this particular person did not like me. Somehow, White and Case lured my husband to meet with them to do estate planning and a will. I don't believe my husband realized White and Case's enduring client was Bankers Trust Company, from the year 1903. However, we did not discuss that issue. Perhaps my husband was not aware of their history, which of course took a lot of research from the group that helped me later. At that time, I knew nothing about their business relationships. They never revealed matters to me, and I believe they had an ethical duty to do so. I had a personal savings account which my husband set up with his broker or financial advisor who was also connected with the White and Case and Bankers Trust group. The trouble is they knew about what money I had because of their relationship, which I found out later is not a great idea because they had known uh, it, basically, it was not good since later on, with all the money available in the estate, they told me to use some of my personal money until they got everything worked out. If I had known then what they were going to do to me, I would have refused. But I trusted them. I didn't know. So now, also, White and Case and Bankers Trust wined and dined us at cocktail parties and also a private luncheon with 
the vice chairman, Phil Hampton, hosted it, and uh, there was Mike Phillip, one of the vice presidents there, and many other, you know, a few others. It was a private, very private luncheon. And they had us at a lot of cocktail parties, and they really gave us the white glove treatment. Also, members of White and Case and Bankers Trust came to our home to discuss business matters, include, including areas of the will. Now, I, I'm going to go into, uh, in the next episode, I'll go into uh, some of the meetings and how they personally... Uh, gave us real personal treatment. I mean, meetings at our home and uh, uh, meetings with them, as I say, their cocktail parties and uh, so on. So I think, Glendor, I'm probably, uh, I probably have had my time for the second episode and I will get prepared for the third episode. Um, Anyway, I, I can just say that, it, it, just to uh, review here what is will be on the third one, is that I recall there was a meeting at my home uh, at which Eddie Jr., my husband's son, attended. And uh, being an artist, I was not up on all of this. I was quiet and I didn't ask questions. and. I remember standing in the doorway of our library after everyone was seated and had tears in my eyes just thinking, what would I do without Edmund, my husband, who helped, protected, and adored me? I mean, my husband saw this, so he asked me to come into the room and to sit near him. Um, so I think, uh, Glendora, I will proceed with the rest of this, this meeting, on episode number three. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening to this. I hope you can follow from one to the next that I have, but thank you very much.